Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor to be speaking to such an incredibly talented and educated group of people. My topic will be curiosity-driven research, and my basic, my basic message is very simple. Support curious people rather than projects. So let me explain why. I want to start out by giving you a number of examples, starting with one of the earliest Nobel Prizes and ending with one of the most recent. Albert Michelson is famous for measuring the speed of light. He did so not for any practical reason, but because he loved color and light. It seems that scientific research, he said, should be regarded as a painter, regards his art, a poet, his poems, a con composer, his music. The argument for the practical value, which is the one, of course, we always sell science on, is not the true reason, he said. The real reason is because you love the work. So you need to find people who love the work. Alexander Fleming also regarded his science very much as a painter, but his paintings were making microbial art, which meant that he had to break all the rules of doing correct science by con purposely contaminating his cultures. And one of the things that contaminated his cultures was Penicillium notatum, the source of penicillin, the first antibiotic. So a painterly game was what gave us that entire technology. Alan McDermott, another Nobel Prize winner in 2000 for his discovery of conductive plastics, also said, my motivations have been driven purely by curiosity and color. There were no scientific reasons whatever. One of his colleagues simply showed him a new silver plastic. He thought, silver, maybe it conducts. What the heck, I'll try it. He didn't have a grant, he didn't make a proposal, he was just curious. Konstantin Novoselov won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for discovering graphenes. Again, he says that this research was not funded, it was not of any practical value, they simply did it for the fun of it, and they did it on Friday afternoons when you could try anything including things that weren't expected to work. And of course, graphenes are now one of the hottest new materials for developing all sorts of technologies. Again, play simply for the sake of it. Donna Strickland, the Nobel Prize winner in physics last year, also is a major proponent of curiosity-driven research. Her work has increased the energy output of lasers 10 orders of magnitude at a time when no one thought that you could increase them at all. And again, she says she did it just for the fun of it, through curiosity, to see what she could actually do. So here's an outline of what I'm going to try to convince you. One is, what is the nature of curiosity-driven research? How can we recognize it? How do we find the important questions that drive it? What's the importance of being multiply trained, polymathic, that is, in driving curiosity? How do you find problems at the intersections of various disciplines, which is where most of the major developments occur? And I really want to emphasize a point that there are no experts in areas of the unknown. So you can't train someone specifically to make a breakthrough. You have to find people who are looking for those areas where there are no experts, where we don't know what we're doing. So that means we have to foster wonder. So let me start with some basic assumptions. There are four of them here, it's really three, but training should develop expertise. This is the way our entire education system is set up. It should focus on skills and techniques of obvious utility. Great if you're developing engineers, not basic scientists. And that specialization is essential 
to success. I want to change those assumptions. The assumptions I want to look at are that innovations are motivated by curiosity and wonder, not expertise. That innovators integrate the polymathic training I talked about before. They're not experts. That innovations combine problems, techniques, materials, processes, and knowledge from disparate fields, which is a difficult thing to do if you aren't asking questions, and that innovators are therefore never experts. So that means wonder and curiosity driven research. Just for the fun of it, I went to the Nobel Prize winning uh, website and looked up on their search engine how many times the word curiosity or curious showed up. 428 times, there are only 500 Nobel Prize winners, so almost all of them mentioned curiosity. And wonder showed up 702 times, so many of them mentioned it twice. So they're curious people, and they know they're curious people, and that's very important. So that means we have to ask the right questions, and that makes questioning the key skill for developing curiosity or basic research. And that means we also have to therefore look at where that curiosity begins. So curious scientists don't want to just know the facts. They don't want to just know what. They want to know how and why and why not something else. All sorts of questions that two-year-olds ask. And in fact, many Nobel Prize winners say, they never grew up. They're still childlike. They're not child, but they are childlike at heart. Kids are ignorant. So are we about lots of the important things. That means that what we need to do through questioning is identify our ignorance. That's what stimulates questioning. And many of the Nobel Prize winners have said explicitly that that's what science is. In fact, I think Carlo Rovelli actually said this last night, that science is a way of asking more and more meaningful questions, and it isn't the answers that make you a scientist. It isn't what you know. It's the asking of new and important and insightful questions. So when we look at Einstein, one of the things he was very explicit about in many of his writings was the idea that the expression of a new problem in a new way was often far more important than coming up with a solution because when you have the right question, you have a very limited number of possible solutions that often can be reached through pure technical understanding. He also said something which I found extremely insightful which is that if he had an hour to answer a question, he would spend 55 minutes of it trying to understand the question and what the real problem is before he even started to try to answer it. Now, I don't think I was ever taught that, and I have not seen a curriculum where this is where students are taught how to handle problems. They immediately want the answer. And in fact, that's what we do a lot when we are doing our grant agencies, we want the answer. But the real question is, what's the problem? Now, why is this important? It's important because when you have the right question, it constrains the possible answers. This is the explanation for what Einstein's talking about. So creative thinking is not thinking outside the box, blue sky, thinking, breaking the rules, all the things that mostly creativity literature is about. It's actually thinking inside the box. And when you have the right question, you define all the elements that constrain that box. And now anything you do inside it is likely to be useful in finding a solution. So we have to learn how to embrace constraints to be creative. So, good questioning. Huge topic, I could talk on this topic for hours, so just a brief summary here. Good questions tend to be focused, but they're neither too broad nor too narrow. If they're too narrow, you don't have any interesting answers. If they're too broad, you don't know what you're looking for. 
they're addressable. There are questions that you can't answer. So these have to be addressable with the kinds of techniques and knowledge we have available. They can be generalized, so it's not one answer to one question which doesn't lead to any other understanding. We want something that gives us a broader understanding. Most importantly, the good questions offer the possibility of surprise. If you know what the answer is going to be, it's not interesting, you're not going to learn anything. But if it looks like it could be surprising, you don't know what the answer is likely to look at, that's really exciting. So you want to make your ex assumptions explicit, or maybe be incredibly naive. There have been Nobel Prizes won for asking questions like, why is the sky blue? Why is hemoglobin red? These are really basic things with no assumptions. They're simply, why is nature the way it is? But they also have to be falsifiable. You also have to be able to ask questions where when you look at it, you could say, hmm, that's the wrong question. And I can prove that's the wrong question. So there are lots of different criteria here. All right, so assuming we now have a good question guide, how do we generate these questions? So here again is a list. Um, I've got a whole section at the end of my book, Discovering, uh, which lists how to do these, how various Nobel Prize winners and people like Charles Darwin uh, actually went about using strategies to develop them. I'm not gonna have time to do more than give you a few tastes of these, but there are things like looking at nature as a child and asking things like, why is the sky blue? Which won a Nobel Prize for Raman and Raman spectroscopy. Um, experiencing the sublimity of the mundane, things that are so obvious in front of us that we don't even look at them anymore. Uh, searching for unexplained patterns. Whenever we've got a pattern that breaks down, whenever we have data that doesn't fit any of our theories, we're on to something really important. But strangely, scientists are like everybody else. We tend to ignore what doesn't fit our preconceptions. We tend to fund what we expect to see. But it's the things that don't fit the patterns, it's the things that break them, which are the most exciting. So wonder, why don't animals like this exist? There's a really childlike question. And you may think it's silly, but I can tell you as an evolutionary biologist that these are actually really important and interesting questions because one of the reasons that we know that evolution by natural selection is correct is not just all the data in the paleontological record, the distribution of species ge geographically and so forth. It's also because evolution explains why these kinds of animals aren't possible. Every organism has to be related to previous organisms. We can't mix and match in nature all the different parts any way we feel like it. But it's also cautionary because it says, with genetic engineering, maybe we can. On the other hand, maybe we can't. So here's where the falsifiable issue comes in. Maybe nature has built into all of these organisms limitations on what can fit with other pieces. I can't take an electronic chip, stick it into a mechanical watch and make it work. Maybe I can't do whatever I want in nature either. So asking why these don't exist in nature actually starts leading to some really interesting speculations, problems, and experiments. So this also changes the way we think about what science is. Science, a lot of Nobel Prize winners tell us, is imaginative play. It's very constrained, it has very definite rules, but it's play. And so here we have Francois Jacob, who won a Nobel Prize in physiology for various forms of feedback regulation that he and his colleagues discovered, and he says, contrary to what I once thought, scientific progress did not consist simply observing and accumulating experimental facts and drawing up a theory from them 
In other words, the standard scientific method as we tend to teach it to our students. Instead, it began with the invention of a possible world. So my wife has actually written a book which is available in Korea called Inventing Imaginary Worlds. And it's based in part on what Jacob is talking about here. In this case, Jacob tells us that what we're doing is you invent this possible world or a fragment of it, which you then compare by experimentation to the real world. And so again, if I go back to the previous slide, what we're doing is finding out about nature by testing all the possible ways we can imagine it might work and finding the one way it actually does work. But you only know that by looking at the alternatives as well. So that's where imagination comes in. Now, again, this sounds very strange if you don't realize how important it is that we imagine all the possibilities before we start testing. And Michael Faraday, by the way, said exactly the same thing. So he's the father of all modern electrical technologies and theory. He said, I could easily believe in any fairy tale if I didn't have a laboratory to test it against. So let me give you some examples of some of these other strategies. One of them is, as I mentioned, sublimity of the mundane. Why is the sky blue? Here's another Nobel Prize one in the same way. C.T.R. Wilson uh, invented the first cloud chambers, which allowed us to see subatomic particles for the first time. Like the other people I talked about at the beginning of my talk, he says, my choice of a subject was not due to anything, scientific reasons here. It's because he actually climbed to the top of Ben Nevis in Scotland and saw coronas and glories, which I have given you pictures of here. And he thought they were so beautiful that he wanted to run back to his laboratory and recreate them, which is what he did. And in the process, he also discovered that clouds form best on ions and subatomical particles make ions. So all of a sudden, he had a way to see them, which nobody had seen before, simply because of the beauty of nature. So where does curiosity come from at heart? Very difficult question, not a lot of research, but one of the clues was given by the first Nobel Prize winner, J.H. Van Hoff. Uh, 1879, he did a study of many of his colleagues and discovered that most of them were multiply trained and that they also expressed uh, their art as Roger Penrose, sorry, their science as Roger Penrose in other forms of creative activity, such as art. Van Hoff himself was an artist. He was a flautist of some talent. He opened up five different sciences. He was one of the founders of the history of science. He wrote poetry in four different languages. He knew what he was talking about. What we're talking about here are polymaths, people with developed training in more than one area. But more importantly, polymaths are people who integrate what they know in multiple areas. So if you think about Leonardo da Vinci with all of his skills, the artist, engineer, inventor, putting all these things together for tremendous new knowledge. My wife and I and various of my students have very done many published studies at this point showing that in fact Nobel Prize winners are polymaths they have far more artistic uh, crafts, musical, literary training, 15 to 25 times the uh, amount of activity in these areas that the average person does or the average scientist does. And they're very explicit about how these various uh, forms of their knowledge are useful to them. Just as an example, Walter, Walter Gilbert, who gave us the first major ways to sequence genes, uh, was a physicist, biophysicist, biochemist, molecular biologist, businessman, entrepreneur, and describes himself as an artist and photographer as well. This is all straight out of his own biography. This is how he sees himself. So intra-domain polymathy 
is also important. You just saw that Wally Gilbert had training in multiple sciences. This turns out to be typical of people in the sciences who win Nobel Prizes. They have an average of three formal degrees in different sciences and often work at their intersections, taking information techniques, problems, and so forth between them. Gertrude Ellian is a good example. She's the one who gave us rational drug design. She started as an organic chemist, became a biochemist, then a pharmacologist, added immunology, then microbiology, finally virology, and actually gave us drugs that were major sellers and breakthrough drugs in each of those areas. So these are very different people. In addition, there's also intra and cross domain polymathy among these people, like Van Hoff, many of the most successful and creative people find ways to mix all of their different interests. Albert Einstein said in multiple places that his music was the driving force of his imagination and underpinned the architectonics of how he actually thought about and devised general relativity. Held Croto won the Nobel Prize for inventing Buckminster Fuller, Fullerines. And this isn't by accident. He had been an artist since he was a kid. That's a self-portrait on the left from when he was 13. He had, even while he was do doing his Nobel Prize winning work, considered leaving chemistry to become a full-time designer. He had actually applied to Buckminster Fuller to work with him. So he was very familiar with Buckminster Fuller geodesic domes. And when they started showing up in his chemical analyses, he was prepared to see what they meant and how they worked. I should also say that in the context of the Korean education system, there are probably a dozen Nobel Prize winners who did something that would probably be impossible here. And that is that they took a non-academic approach to their education. They took the technical track. One of the people is Luis Alvarez. His father actually sent him to a technical high school to learn how to do electronics, woodwork, metalwork, and so forth. And this prepared him to become one of the most innovative inventors of high energy particle machines that has ever lived. And as I say, many other Nobel Prize winners also did that. They knew they were smart enough to do the academic part, but they wanted those other skills in order to be able to work that way. So the critical point here is that we want a broad education, but it also has to be integrated. We have to help our students see that all knowledge can be linked. We can't tell people in advance how to do this, but we can encourage our students by giving them exemplars to say there are an infinite number of possible mixtures. Look at these people, find out what stimulates you, gets you excited, makes you curious, and see if you can find ways to do this. So this brings us back to that whole issue of curiosity. Christian Nusslin Volhard, Nobel Prize winner in 1995, is a wonderful way to exemplify all the things I've been talking about. Again, like so many of the people I've talked about, she said, what drove me into science was, I think, a very big curiosity. I like to understand things. And it's very important she used the word understand because she didn't just want to know things, which can be passive. She wanted to understand why they are the way they are, how they work, what you can do them. That's what understanding is. It's applied knowledge. So I want to understand things and not only science, but other things as well. And so she lists her literary, artistic. She is a illustrated all of her own uh, papers. So these are some of her own paintings here. She loves puzzles, intellectual puzzles, but also on the left, she makes her own puzzles and they're fiendishly difficult because they don't work the way the usual puzzles does. She even thinks about puzzles differently than everyone else. When she wasn't in the lab, she liked to cook. So she has a best-selling 
German language cookbook, which has been in print for 10 years now. She loves to explore things. So here she says, actually, everything, including science, other than science, but it's really true, it's this curiosity. So back to Einstein, he said he had no special talents compared to anyone else he knew, except one thing, which is that he was passionately curious. So here he says, he was successful not because he was a good student. He wasn't, and I want to emphasize this as well. There are dozens of Nobel Prize winners who almost dropped out of college. There are dozens who flunked major, major tests. There are many who had to try to get into graduate school multiple times before they succeeded. But Einstein says, and I think this is what drove all the Nobel Prize winners, they found something that got them wondering. And they wondered about things to the point they were so curious they had to look at them. So I can't think of any better way to end this talk by talking about perhaps the most curious and wondrous physicist who has ever lived, perhaps, and that's Richard Feynman. Feynman is shown here playing the bongo gums. He loved to play, he loved to explore. Like Poincaré, who I quoted or talked about earlier, uh, he thought that you do science because you love it, because it's fun. In Feynman's case, what he said is, physics is like sex. Sure, it may give some practical results, but that's not why you do it. Now, why do you do it? And on that point, Feynman said the following, I wonder why, I wonder why. I wonder why I wonder. I wonder why I wonder why I wonder why I wonder. <laughs> if we could answer that question, we'd have the key to creative education. I don't have all the answers here, but what I do know and what I do wish for you is that you can develop a system that can develop people as curious and wondrous and wonderful as Feynman and Einstein and provide them an institutional system that doesn't make it impossible for them to work, that allows them to be different, allows them to work in their own way, and gives them the freedom to make those discoveries which are so practical and which we really want in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here in Korea. I've never been here before, so it was a very exciting experience for me. I have a lot of Korean students, um, and I'm going to go back and report to them that everything is going very well here back home. Uh, what I would like to talk to you about today is a sociological experiment in science. The experiment is, how can we build a total environment for scientists, an environment where scientists are happy and where they're most productive? And that experiment exists at the Genelia Research Campus of the HHMI. So, uh, who is, um, who's Howard Hughes and how did the Howard Hughes Medical Institute get uh, started. Howard Hughes was an aircraft engineer. He built some of the world's best aircraft, and uh, the company uh, became Transworld Airways, which I think you've all heard about. And when he was 19 years old, he decided that he would like to give all his money to science to support basic research 
for the benefit of mankind. And so he founded the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in 1953 with a two billion dollar investment that has now grown to 20 billion dollars. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute has approximately now 335 investigators, and these investigators are chosen from hundreds and thousands of applications in an open competition. And this is important. Anybody can apply in the United States to become a Howard Hughes medical investigator. And uh, these uh, applicants are screened very thoroughly by panels of scientists, Nobel Prize winners, and uh, 20 of them are chosen um, about every three years to replace the ones that have retired, so that there's a steady state of 335 investigators. They all come from diverse backgrounds, engineering, physics, chemistry, and their only criterion is that they do excellent science. So how are they evaluated? Well, uh, they're evaluated by being, having already proven themselves as excellent scientists by, uh, by having achieved some uh, success in the academic environment. But the important uh, principle of the Howard Hughes uh, is that they fund people, not projects. It's not what the people do, it's just that they're excellent. They are funded for five years, and they're uh, renewable on five years, uh, uh, at five-year intervals, and they present their work orally to a panel of scientists. Um, and the criterion is not what you've published, not what you've produced, but it is, um, it is what you're planning to do and how ambitious your plans are and how well-suited you are to complete those plans. The funding from the Institute contains all the salary, the benefits, uh, all the equipment and overhead, anything you need in your academic institution for your success. And you present your work uh, to the other uh, Hughes investigators every few years. How they are selected, they have to have a MD or PhD, hold a tenure track position as an assistant professor. They have to have more than three, but less than 12 years of experience as a uh, academic professional. And um, they have to be a principal investigator on a grant. So um, what is a goal here? The goal is to reduce the dependence of the investigator on the government for funding, for money. And that will allow them more time to do research. In, additional, in addition, there are, uh, I want to say, 10 international scholars. The HHMI funds people from all countries, uh, and there are 10. And I want to point out uh, Heyoon Park, uh, at uh, Seoul National University. I put this picture up to, simply to embarrass her because she's somewhere in the audience. But I, I uh, am very proud of her. She's uh, one of the first women in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Seoul National University. So how has the Howard Hughes Institute done? Um, well, the Howard Hughes Institute to date has a 29 Nobel Prizes, which would, if, if the Howard Hughes were a country, it would be number six, right after Sweden. So this whole plan of funding uh, science and selecting science on the basis of excellence has paid off in this uh, example of, stu of, these, uh, of these investigators uh, winning Nobel Prizes, if that's a criterion that's important. So if the Howard Hughes Institute is so successful, 
in making And um, the model for building the Genelia Research Campus, where the Howard Hughes now has its own institution, it doesn't pay money to other academic institutions, but it has its own group of scientists that it can, um, on which it can build a scientific environment. And the model that has been used is the Bell Laboratories. The most successful uh, research institution uh, ever. Uh, winner, nine Nobel Prize winners passed through Bell Labs. And the principles of Bell Labs were, uh, were that the scientists would simply be free to follow their own interests within the context of the telecommunications industry. So the goal of the Howard Hughes, uh, the, the Genelia campus, is to attack large team-style challenges, such as you have in physics, we've heard about, um, so that, uh, so that the, the, the scientific challenges will be now accessible to large teams with diverse expertise, electronics, uh, communications, uh, computer science, uh, physics, and so forth. And uh, the idea was to uh, try to understand the nervous system. The other was to provide an environment that is totally dedicated to science, that is, where talented young scientists have only to think about science without other distractions, that is, without the need to raise their own funding, without the need to teach. If they want to teach, they can go to a university, or the need to administer their laboratories. And foremost, it's to establish an all-encompassing research community where all the scientists there feel united in a common purpose, for which Future progress requires technological innovation, and then foster the establishment of integrated teams of biologists and tool builders who seek to break through the existing barriers. So how is this, um, how is this funded? It was funded uh, with a $400 million capital investment. Um, its running budget is about 15% of the HHMI budget are about $150 million a year. So I'll give you a timeline of how this institution came to be. In uh, 2000, they purchased a 660-acre farm. This was to create a very large campus for, uh, for the scientific uh, building. And it's in uh, Virginia about 40 minutes from Washington, D.C., and 15 minutes from Dulles Airport. They then selected a famous architect, Raphael Vignoli, who uh, then proceeded to work with a scientist to design the building. And they selected an exceptional individual, Jerry Rubin, who was uh, an HHI investigator at Berkeley, uh, who was appointed director of planning. So they just started with the design uh, process. The design uh, were, went on for several years, working with scientists to think about what they really need. And um, they also had a workshop to determine what sort of research areas that they were interested in uh, investigating. And a number of Nobel Prize winners participated in this. Um, in the design of the building and also the planning for future research. So what were the organizational principles they, they um, came up with? Well, they modeled the research culture for Genelia primarily on two, the two institutions that they considered to have the most successful 
research environments that ever existed. And I mentioned one of them. Although uh, Bell Labs studied solid state physics, for instance, and it had 3,000 employees, uh, and the lab of molecular biology was a government lab in Cambridge devoted to basic biology with 300 employees, they shared key operating principles. First, they had small individual research groups. In the case of Janelia, about 50 lab heads were, uh, uh, were going to be the steady state level. The research is only internally funded. That is, there's no government funding, no commercial funding. It's all internally funded by the Howard Hughes. And the scientists um, have no um, concern about the, where the money's coming from. It's always there. It's always, always been allocated for their needs. They also had excellent support facilities, and they wanted to have group leaders that were active in the laboratory actually doing science. They did not want to have a tenure system, but they would have renewable five-year appointments, as I mentioned, that would be evaluated on the basis of how their uh, plans are coming along for their, the, their big goals. Uh, there have to be opportunities for visiting scientists for collaborations from outside, and there have to be incentives for these collaborative uh, efforts. So through uh, workshops and discussions that were held over a period of years, they identified potential areas of interest that Janelia was going to be investigating. They held workshops with the entire scientific community. They evaluated these research ideas, and they chose one or two research areas. Here's one of the questions they asked for the workshop. It's the thousand-person-year question. Suppose you were given generous funding to assemble a group of 100 people for a period of 10 years and asked to tackle an important biological problem that was not easily approached in an academic setting. What problem or question would you choose to tackle? The criteria was that the problem has to have high potential impact. That is, if you make progress on this, that you have a, uh, that you have a very high impact in the scientific world. And the deletion test means that if you, if you didn't do it, it would, it would be very deleterious to the scientific community. It has to not be actively pursued elsewhere by other research institutions or by NIH. And it has to be better done at Genelia than anywhere else. So, um, if the um, HHMI identifies a research area to support, they want to know, are, are we better holding a specialized competition in that area, um, or assembling a number of groups at Genelia Farm? So there were conclusions that came out of these workshops. Um, one was to identify general principles that govern how information is processed by groups of neurons, and to developing enabling technologies for imaging and image analysis to investigate those neuronal connections. So the, uh, the building began, and the building is uh, almost 1,000 meters long, um, and it fits into the landscape, uh, in, into a hill, it was built into a hill, very energy efficient and green, and it is really quite a beautiful structure to behold because it's made mostly of glass. And what the glass does is it creates a transparent and light environment throughout the whole building so that even walking in the in the hallways, um, the ceilings and the walls are made from glass. So as you walk in the hallways, you pass the laboratories, you see the people in the laboratory, they see you. There's this in, uh, implicit interaction where you can uh, 
um, pick them up to go to lunch, for instance, or uh, ask them questions. And you can see here the laboratories are totally open uh, with a hallway in between, totally open to the outside through the glass structure. The, um, also, the uh, mission is to supply scientific support because the lab uh, is a small lab. The support services are important because they provide the expertise in things that normal university labs would have to do themselves, like tissue culture and growing fruit flies or doing electron microscopy. This all is being done there by experts in these, um, in these uh, group uh, uh, support services facilities. And uh, for instance, they have an entire instrumentation group that will build you any instrument that you need that doesn't exist commercially. Uh, Tim Harris is a director. He also came from Bell Labs. And uh, the Advanced Phy Physics Instrumentation Group is uh, composed really of physicists and engineers who can uh, help to design the next generation of microscopes, for instance. One of the project teams is uh, to map the entire nervous system of the mouse brain. So here uh, are mouse neurons expressing uh, fluorescent proteins that are being driven by uh, particular promoters for those uh, neurons that are unique to those neurons. And um, the idea is to develop a connectome for the mouse brain. One of the most uh, remarkable uh, advances is the ability to see the actual nerves, individual nerves, in a zebrafish firing the electrically using a dye that was developed at Genelia called uh, uh, G-CAMP, which is a calcium dye. And uh, it is, uh, when it flashes, that nerve has been excited. And this is a zebrafish, live zebrafish, in the act of swimming. And you can see all the nerves that are being activated by this process. And the microscopy that was developed for this light sheet microscopy uh, was developed in uh, Eric Betzik's lab. So the collaboration of the scientists and engineers yield the synergy which makes things possible that you couldn't have thought of before. Now, uh, what's going to happen to Genelia? Well, Genelia is going to reinvent itself over the next 15 years. It has decided that it has accomplished its mission for neuroscience, and it will now uh, request uh, uh, some goals, some uh, guidance to develop new research goals. And they will fund these research goals with $300 million guaranteed for 15 years. And the competition is open to the entire world, that is. It's requested proposals from any group anywhere to come to Genelia and carry out this research. Okay, so I want to propose here whether uh, something could be done here in Korea that would be like a uh, Genelia. And I would argue that because having uh, Korean students uh, I know that Korean students are as good as uh, Korean scientists are as good as scientists anywhere in the world. And what we could, what you could do here would be to provide an environment like Genelia where these scientists could excel. And uh, you would need an substantial sub endowment of two billion dollars. Uh, You'd need a major land acquisition to form a campus. You'd need about $500 million to build the building and the structures that create a community, child care facilities, food services, a gym, a hotel, and so forth, um, that I described to you. You would form workshops here that would be particularly uh, based on Korean strength 
in, say, telecommunications and, um, and couple it with the biological sciences. Uh, and then identify 50 of your best scientists in all field and offer them 10 years of funding to work on whatever they want to work. Total freedom within the larger challenge and not in a hierarchical structure. They have total control over their lives. And I would argue that uh, the females will provide additional resource. You could, people have said, well, Korea is a small country. Uh, we can't, uh, we don't have the resources. But if you include the females in the scientific endeavor to the level of the 50% uh, of, of equality for this process, you will essentially have many more terrific scientists to work with. And so uh, I suggest in closing that this might be a roadmap for thinking about how Korea could become a really outstanding uh, community, an outstanding country in the, in the scientific world and, and create the environment where you could really put your best minds to work. So I want to thank you, and, uh, and I appreciate being here. It's been really a lot of fun and very exciting to hear these talks. Thank you.